It was 1931, and a slim, pallid figure with dyed blonde hair lay on a bed in a cheap room. She looked like she'd been through hell, and that would be a fair description of the life of Mary Nolan. And yet, at one point, she was adored, worshipped, and idolized as one of the early Hollywood goddesses. Across from her was the veteran Hollywood journalist, Gladys Hall, trying to figure out the catalyst for this. Maybe the greatest fall from grace in movie history. Nolan was no longer famous, but infamous. She'd been in prison, been a junkie, and changed her name and identity more times than most people could remember. But above all, she'd suffered and been abused by some of the most powerful and dangerous men in Hollywood. Gladys Hall wrote this about her following their meeting. So delicate she appeared, almost untouchable. Her gray eyes brimmed with slow, ignored tears. She wept with the resignation of someone accustomed to sorrow, barely acknowledging her own tears. What chance do they stand, really? These exquisite creatures set adrift on fragile vessels, lacking guidance. How can we judge them, born with the countenance of angels, yet thrust into the clutches of fiends? This is the horrifying story of Mary Nolan. Welcome to Hollywood Mysteries, Episode 12. <laughs> Jean Robertson's early years were marked by extreme hardship. Born to a struggling family in Kentucky, she was the youngest of five siblings, arriving in the world on December 18, 1902. She was born to Africanus Gabriel and Viola Pittman Robertson. Tragedy struck early, when at just three years old she lost her mother, who passed away at 46. This left her father, a frail farmhand and carpenter, to fend for the family alone, with three children still under the age of 10. Eventually, Africanus found it too challenging to care for Mary. She spent a period living with a foster family in Kentucky before being sent to a Catholic orphanage in St. Joseph, Missouri, away from her siblings. It was in this orphanage that she received the nickname Bubbles. In June 1912, the orphanage was informed that Mary would briefly return to Kentucky her eldest sister, Myrtle McDaniels, along with Myrtle's baby, born in January, were gravely ill. Tragically, Myrtle succumbed to tetanus on June 2nd. Her infant son passed two weeks later. After a short stay with an elderly grandmother in Kentucky, who was ill-equipped to care for her, Mary went back to the orphanage. She remained there until age 13. She then journeyed to New York City to join her sister, Mabel, who had become an actress and was married to actor Charles Rondeau. It was Mabel who had introduced Mary to the world of the stage. Arriving in New York in 1919, without a penny to her name, the stunning blonde with china blue eyes quickly caught the attention of those around her. Shortly after reaching New York, Mary crossed paths with Arthur William Brown, a well-known magazine illustrator. Brown showed a particular interest in the young newcomer, and even introduced her to his wife, who kindly provided Mary with new clothes. Before long, Mary found herself posing for Brown and became a resident at the Artists and Models Club. Mary rapidly rose to prominence as a leading model of the era, working with famed illustrators such as James Montgomery Flagg, Norman Rockwell, and Charles Dana Gibson. By August 1922, in addition to her modeling work, Mary took her first steps onto the stage with her debut in the musical comedy Daffy Dill, which enjoyed a two-month run at the Apollo Theater. This was followed by a five-month stint in the chorus of another musical, Lady Butterfly. During her time in Daffy Dill, Mary crossed paths with Frank Tinney, the show's 44-year-old leading man. One rainy night after a performance, Mary was trying to flag down a taxi when Tinney, already in one, stopped and offered her a lift. She ended up inviting him to her place, and he spent the night. Tinney, a married man with a young son from his wife, former singer and dancer Edna Davenport, was known for his heavy drinking. He was born in Philadelphia as the third child of Hugh Francis and Mary, both of Irish-American heritage. Tinney dabbled in performances with his brother at local events, 
and had a brief stint on a vaudeville show as a child. Despite his parents' hopes for him to enter the medical field, Tinney pursued various menial jobs, including chief lifeguard at Atlantic City, fire engine driver, and undertaker's assistant, the latter of which, curiously enough, led him to a minstrel show. By 1907, Tinney had made his mark in vaudeville across the U.S. and Canada, debuting in New York in 1910, and securing roles in productions led by Gertrude Hoffman and Eva Tangway. This success brought him to the Schubert Brothers' review of reviews at the Winter Garden Theater and numerous Broadway shows throughout his career. Mary was completely smitten with Tinney, feeling valued and loved for the first time. However, the discovery of a Mrs. Tinney rocked her world. This led her to confront Frank about the wife he had failed to mention. Sure, was Tinney's cavalier reply. I have a wife and a mortgage and an appendix, but why should I bring those things up and ruin a good evening? I believe a man should keep his problems to himself. By then, it was too late for Mary to detach herself. She was deeply enamored, as was Tinney, or at least so he said. He moved her into an apartment on West 72nd Street, lavishing her with gifts, but also inflicting serious physical and emotional harm on her. Tinney was a sadist with a violent, drunken temper. Mary was young and inexperienced, but had grown up tough, and would challenge Tinney to hit her again, trying to hide her fear. Cruelly, he always did. Meanwhile, Mary, now known as Imogene Bubbles Wilson, made her debut in the Siegfeld Follies, appearing in the 1923 show alongside Eddie Cantor, Fanny Bryce, and Anne Pennington. Mary quickly rose to fame as a beloved Siegfeld girl, making such an impression that by 1922, New York Daily News columnist Mark Hellinger remarked, only two people in America could gather every New York reporter at the docks for their departure. One is the president, the other is Imogene Bubbles Wilson. However, her time in the 1924 Ziegfeld Follies was tumultuous. In May, after a typical argument, Mary attempted inflicting lethal damage upon herself. A few days afterward, she summoned Hellinger to her apartment to share her story directly. But that evening, Frank Tinney arrived unexpectedly and decided to take a nap at Mary's place. When Hellinger showed up around 9.30 p.m., Tinney awoke, flew into a rage, assuming Hellinger was Mary's lover, and attacked them both. Mary later described the ordeal in court, saying, Mr. Tinney emerged from the room wearing my blue silk kimono and the maid's earrings, spewing terrible language. I prefer not to repeat it. Who's this? Tinney demanded. A reporter, I said. Tinney said, I don't believe you. At this point, he tried to fight Hellinger. After the reporter departed, Tinney violently assaulted Mary. He was arrested the following day, but when questioned about the charges as he dismissed the whole event, explaining it was something Mary wouldn't pursue, he painted her as a hysterical actress, making a drama out of the situation. Her injuries, however, told their own story. Tinney's wife was called in to give her thoughts, and she said, Why, this is just a foolish little girl. That has always believed everything Frank told her. She has my sympathy, and I am very sorry for her. Mary, flanked by her sister Mabel and her maid, appeared in court the next morning. They were resolute in pressing charges and filed a $100,000 lawsuit against Tinney. After leaving the courtroom, she fainted, requiring rest until the area cleared. A week later, Mary testified about the constant abuse and her multiple attempts against her own life stating, I wanted to die. I was tired of being beaten by Frank Tinney. Her maid, Carrie Sneed, supported her claims. She went on record with what Mary said to her. Carrie, don't let him kill me. Tinney's defense requested the case be dropped, claiming it was merely a publicity stunt. The judge, Max Levine, denied this motion. Later, a grand jury declined to indict Tinney based on Mary's testimony. Tinney later said, Things looked pretty dark for me. That's the first time I ever made good without raising a laugh. He also maintained that the whole episode was for publicity, adding, if a woman beats a man, that isn't news. If a man beats a woman, that's news. 
I also know why they call actors and actresses hams. She's been cured now. It seems Tinny's unrepentant callousness knew no bounds. Following the grand jury's decision, Tinny planned an escape to England's vaudeville scene. He scheduled his departure for early August 1924 on the liner Columbus. Yet just two days before his voyage, Tinny and Nolan found themselves back together. They were captured by a photographer's lens outside a Broadway theater in the wee hours of the night. Tinny's reaction was to destroy the photographer's camera. This now led to an assault lawsuit filed by the paparazzo. To dodge the press, Tinny opted to board the Columbus a day ahead of his planned departure. As he awaited boarding on August 5th, he was hit with legal papers from his wife, Edna Davenport, who had initiated separation proceedings after his nightclub visit with Nolan came to light. He also received legal documents from the aggrieved photographer. Tinny's only comment to the press was a cryptic, it's a long worm that's not turning, before retreating to his stateroom, visibly deflated. Meanwhile, at the Tinney family home in Long Island, Mrs. Tinney remained tight-lipped, only confirming her ongoing legal action. Secluded on the ship, Tinney revealed he had secured a $10,000 payment from Sam H. Harris to break off his music box review contract. He was intending to start anew in London with a lucrative deal, partly to sidestep the growing scandal and legal troubles. Mrs. Tinney had previously publicly supported her husband during his trial, However, Frank's covert reconciliation with Nolan proved to be too much for her. The next morning, Nolan arrived to see Tinny off. They secluded themselves in his cabin to avoid the media. Nolan had to be forcibly dragged down the ship's gangplank after disregarding the captain's final departure call. She was visibly distraught. As the Columbus sailed away, Nolan tearfully confessed to reporters her undying love for Tinny, admitting... He's the only thing in my life. I know it. You know it. So why should I beat around the bush? This emotional spectacle led Florence Sigfeld, who is averse to bad press, to terminate Nolan's employment later that day. Sigfeld justified his decision by stating that Nolan had violated her promise to end her ties with Tinny. He said she had been fired to safeguard the troops' morale and avoid further scandal. Europe now seemed to be the refuge where the watchful eyes of scandal wouldn't follow the erstwhile folly star. In early September, Mary got a passport, outlining plans to visit the British Isles, France, Germany, Italy, and Austria, destinations that coincidentally precisely matched Frank Tinney's itinerary. By September 20th, 1924, she was Europe-bound, telling journalists, I certainly am not going to dodge Frank if we happen to meet in Europe. I am very unhappy and I want to go away. I may stay away forever. From now on, I will lead a quiet life. Mary's European journey began in London, where she naively gave Tinny another chance. However, by December, Tinny's escalating alcoholism and aggression left Mary seeking an escape. Now almost permanently covered in bruises, she finally recognized Tinny's true nature, a dismal figure unworthy of her time. Her liberation came with an opportunity to act in German films. She set out for Berlin, and this was her final departure from Tinny. Upon Tinny's 1925 return to New York, he discovered a diminished circle of friends and fading audience appeal. His marital reconciliation efforts failed by March 1926, around which time Tinny faced a cascade of health problems, starting with complications from broken ribs due to a fall this was followed by a nervous breakdown, all of which thwarted his career revival attempts. By 1930, he had retreated to Philadelphia to live with his father, his once flourishing career now a memory. Tinney passed away on November 28, 1940, from a lung condition after an extended period at Veterans Hospital in Northport, Long Island. Despite once earning $1,500 weekly at his zenith, his final days saw him penniless his fortune eroded by divorce settlements, legal fees, and health costs. A World War I Army Quartermaster Corps captain, Tinney received military honors at his funeral in Holy Cross Cemetery, Yadin, Pennsylvania. Under the name Imogene Robertson, Mary Nolan debuted on film with the German studio UFA in Die Feuertanzerin. 
Her performance thrilled German audiences, leading UFA to secure her talents with a contract. Her earnings soared to around $1,500 weekly, and she became an important figure in the illustrious Weimar era of German cinema. Mary finally gained admiration for her acting, and her acting alone. She was gradually distancing herself from her past. Often wearing eye-catching, scanty gowns, Mary became a constant presence in German cinematic productions throughout 1924 and 1925. Hollywood began to take notice. Soon, studios were sending her invitations to return stateside. Although keen on re-establishing her dignity and contributing meaningfully to American cinema, Mary approached most of these overtures with caution. However, when Joseph Skank reached out, she found the offer too compelling to dismiss. She signed a deal with United Artists and by January 1927 was en route to New York. Who knows what would have become of her had she stayed in the wild and free world of Weimar, Germany. That world only had six years left to run before a catastrophic new force would demolish it forever, but her return to Los Angeles would also be a fateful one. However, the lure of a new beginning in America wasn't just about career rehabilitation for Mary, it was also financial necessity. She found herself ensnared in $20,000 worth of debt accrued from an inability to resist extravagant European fashion and luxury items. Her time in Berlin also included undergoing surgery, which she attributed to damages inflicted by Tinny. In her final stretch in Germany, Mary was accompanied by a nurse, rumored to be employed more for fending off creditors than for actual health care. Mary's dream of reinventing herself in Hollywood hit a snag as soon as her return to the U.S. became public knowledge. Women's organizations voiced strong opposition, and Hollywood's moral guardian, Will Hayes, harbored serious doubts about her suitability for the industry. In those days, women's rights groups did not look too kindly on women like Mary, believing her troubles to have been caused by her own immorality, rather than the sadistic and abusive nature of her lover. In Hollywood, Mary secured a residence on Beechwood Drive, nestled in the Hollywood Hills. She then endured a lengthy wait before the prevaricating studio reached out. When they finally did, they suggested annulling her contract and sending her back to Germany. Mary insisted that she was not after their money and would seek opportunities at other studios if necessary. United Artists agreed, but raised a concern that her name, Imogene Wilson, was too cumbersome for movie marquees. They proposed she adopt the more wholesome-sounding Mary Nolan as her professional name. She accepted this compromise. Mary later said, Of course they were trying to tell me in a polite way that Imogene Wilson and everything associated with that name would be booed from the screen all over the land. They had given me my new identity, a fresh start, and an effort to bury my past. She landed a minor part in Topsy and Eva in 1927, featuring the Duncan sisters, Rosetta and Vivian, followed by a role as Neil Astor's love interest in Sorrel and Son. The production had a cast that included H.B. Warner, Anna Q. Nilsson, Carmel Myers, Lionel Belmore, Alice Joyce, and Louis Walheim. It was relocated to England in July 1927 to complete filming. Returning to Hollywood by mid-August, Mary secured a leading role contract with Universal, Amidst settling into the film capital, she found herself entangled in yet another tumultuous romance, this time with MGM executive, Eddie Mannix, whom she encountered at the Coconut Grove one evening. Mannix was probably the most notorious man in Hollywood. He was known as the Fixer, the guy a star a studio could call to fix any problem. And Mannix had all the necessary mob ties to fix some problems permanently. He would become embroiled in a few scandals over the years, including Joan Crawford's erotic film and the mysterious death of George Reeves, both of which you can hear all about in upcoming episodes of Hollywood Mysteries. But the number of scandals he successfully dropped into the Los Angeles River will never likely be known. In any case, neither he nor Mary was deterred by the fact that he was married, as they both fell for one another. He was a man's man, Mary later wrote, masculine in every sense of the word. That's the only kind that ever has appealed to me. 
I've had no time for sissy, slick-haired Romeos. But there would be nothing masculine about the way Mannix treated Nolan, but merely the actions of another sadist. Meanwhile, Mary poured her efforts into her debut Universal film, Good Morning Judge. In this movie, she portrayed an affluent social worker who establishes a refuge for former offenders. Variety praised her transition from Imogene Wilson to Mary Nolan, noting that the former Imogene Wilson should get applause for her work. It is not only sincere and convincing, but registers her as possessing the camera and lighting appreciation of an old timer. Her subsequent film, Foreign Legion, also won acclaim. One report read, Mary Nolan plays a selfish, gold-digging blonde, and she does it very well. She's the type of impersonal, characterless beauty, and with a narrow range of characterization, should prosper on the screen. Here, she was distinctly an asset on merit, and without reference to her publicity possibilities. While on loan to MGM in mid-1928, Mary took on the role of Maisie in West of Zanzibar. The movie tells the story of Flint, portrayed by the iconic Lon Chaney. Flint is a former vaudeville performer who uses a wheelchair and is driven by a desire for revenge. His target is Crane, played by Lionel Barrymore, who not only stole Flint's fiance, but also caused the accident that led to Flint's paralysis. The plot thickens when Flint, who had maliciously forced Maisie into a demeaning life, expecting to offer her in a native ritual, discovers she is his daughter, born before his fiance left him. In a dramatic turn of events, Flint saves Maisie. West of Zanzibar was another hit, perhaps Mary's most notable Hollywood performance. Film Vax journalist Brett Wood gave high praise to Mary's casting, saying, she was able to radiate the deep sensuality of an experienced woman while managing to evoke sympathy for the innocent girl's plight. Critics recognized the sorrow in Nolan's gaze that was more poignant than the performance of many more seasoned actresses. But then her real life sorrows were far more seasoned than most people of her age by that time. Mary's career seemed to be moving well as she took a role opposite John Gilbert in 1930's Desert Nights, his last silent film. Variety acknowledged her improved performance, stating, Miss Nolan does better work than usual in this picture. Things could have been about to turn around for her at last, but fate had other ideas. She was about to be drawn back into a spiral of abuse and unhappiness that she would never escape from. Like Frank Tinney, Eddie Mannix was violent towards Mary, often treating her as his target for physical abuse. One such assault left Mary critically injured, necessitating multiple surgeries in a Los Angeles hospital. The painful recovery process involved her having to use a wheelchair for some time. The pain she experienced required drugs, and this was the onset of drug dependency, a tragic consequence of the abuse she endured. Mary's trajectory in the film industry was brought to a halt by her descent into drug dependency. This reflected in the diminishing quality of her performances at Universal. It was ironic that in Shanghai Lady, she portrayed a prostitute who resolves to change her life after an extended stay in an opium den. In Young Desire, she took on the role of a carnival dancer who tragically ends her life, believing she's not suited for her young, naive socialite lover, played by William Janney. Despite his extensive theatrical background, Janney had never encountered anyone as complex as Mary Nolan. Recalling his experience in 1991, Janney rather unsympathetically remarked, she took dope and practically everything else. She was supposed to have had all these diseases, and it scared me to death when she would stick her tongue down my throat during our love scenes and rub herself all over me. I would go to the dressing room and gargle with Listerine because I was terrified she was going to give me something. By the time she starred alongside Janny, Mary's addiction was fully blown. She explained, A nurse was with me constantly. I had been given hypodermics to ease my excruciating pain. The nurse always was at hand to give me a relieving shot and the torture became unbearable after I finished the scene. Her final scene in Young Desire, depicting her death, was excruciating for her. Despite the use of a stunt double for the riskier parts, Mary performed the close-up herself. The fall, though short, 
and into a safety net, aggravated her injuries severely. In her own words, this is how she remembered it. I was supposed to commit suicide by jumping from a high platform. My double had performed the more dangerous episodes, but I had to do this one, a close-up myself. I leaped off. The hidden net was only a few feet below me, but that short fall wrenched my injuries and almost killed me. I was in a state of collapse when I was taken down. Again, my nurse was waiting with a hypo that brought relief. I thought nothing of it. I didn't know that I had been given up as incurable by the doctors, that they were pampering my wishes to continue my screen work. I felt I had to carry on while my talents were in demand. In July 1930, Mary was under scrutiny in a narcotics probe. After affidavits from two nurses, revealed her heavy drug use, with one noting her arms bore numerous injection sites. Amid the investigation, a severe sunburn led to her hospitalization at St. Vincent's Hospital, which inadvertently shielded her from the narcotics agents ready to inspect her home. However, an investigator who managed to examine her in the hospital reported, perhaps somewhat dubiously, I failed to find a single mark of a needle. I am firmly convinced that Miss Nolan is not an addict. Mary viewed the investigation as a ploy to hinder her career progression and to tarnish her image within Hollywood circles. Her fiery disposition did her no favors in improving her situation in Hollywood. At Universal, she clashed with director Ernst Lemley about her role in What Men Want. She expressed her displeasure to Lemley for being excluded from certain close-ups, with the director favoring other cast members instead. Upon arriving on set one day, she discovered she was denied entry, voicing her grievances about the director's unfair treatment to Carl Lemley Jr., the production chief, didn't help. That's ridiculous, Lemley Jr. said. It's merely a matter of too much temperament. We have taken only 30 scenes in nine days of the picture. She was replaced by Pauline Stark. Furious, Mary vowed never to return to the studio, even at the cost of her film career alleging that the studio's actions had marred her professional reputation. She intended to sue. However, Carl Lemley countered her accusations, more or less telling her to bring on the lawsuit. The dispute was resolved in January 1931, when Universal agreed to buy out the remainder of her contract, but by now she was considered a poison chalice. Photoplay's Cal York commented, That Nolan girl has torn Universal limb to limb. She has passed fighting talk to everyone from Carl Lemley, down to the boy who waters the elephants. She has demanded, raged, stormed, and caused more trouble than a hundred ordinary actresses. Following this ordeal, Mary was left with only minor roles from lesser-known studios, and her life continued to spiral. In February 1931, she became a person of interest to the police when a rug vanished from a property she had rented. From director Lambert Hillier, the rug later surfaced at a doctor's office, who claimed Mary had offered it as partial payment for medical services. Despite previously stating her disinterest in marriage until her career had concluded, Mary married millionaire broker Wallace T. Macri in March 1931. She announced plans to begin filming a movie about racketeering, followed by a vaudeville tour with her new husband. However, a week before their wedding, Macri's fortune took a hit, losing over $3 million due to a stock market downturn. Nonetheless, the couple invested the remaining $9,000 of his wealth into opening a dress shop in Beverly Hills. The couple faced even more difficulties when Mary declared bankruptcy in August, disclosing assets of $3,000 against debts nearing $93,000. That same month, an unexpected encounter on a Beverly Hills street corner with two police officers led her to a court appearance over allegations of unpaid wages to five employees, including her cook, chauffeur, nurse, maid, and a musician. She secured her release by posting bail. Subsequently, the dress shop employees lodged wage complaints against her with the State Labor Commission. Ignoring a summons to municipal court, resulted in arrest warrants. A second warrant was issued in December due to another missed court date. By March 1932, 
Mary and her husband faced convictions for 17 violations of labor laws, culminating in a $1,300 fine and a 30-day jail sentence for Mary. Fan clubs across the nation petitioned for her release, showing that she still had widespread support among the public, even if the authorities and Hollywood studios didn't exactly share their views. Seeking a new beginning, Mary moved to New York, and in June announced her intention to divorce Wallace Macri. She expressed to the Los Angeles Times, Yes, I am going to divorce Wallace. He is the nicest man I know, and I am terribly fond of him, but we are a drawback to each other. It's just another lot of trouble. We were married in New York a week after he lost his whole fortune, in one afternoon on the stock exchange. Like children, we thought money didn't matter and married anyway. We went to Hollywood, but Hollywood did not want me to be married. Everything I do is wrong, even when I do the right thing, even when it is the right thing. Her final cinematic endeavor was File 113, with Allied Pictures in 1933, after which she relocated permanently to New York. In November 1934, police launched a five-state search for Mary, related to a missing $2,000 belonging to show business promoter, Louis Kessman. After meeting Kessman in a tavern and being driven home by him, Kessman later realized his money was missing. Although Mary was arrested, the charges were swiftly dropped following a telegram to the court. In 1935, Mary initiated a $500,000 lawsuit against Eddie Mannix, alleging assault and career sabotage. That year, she also ventured to London to showcase her singing talents at the Piccadilly Theatre, continuing her performance career abroad. In America, Mary's career options had dwindled to performing in modest roadhouses and clubs. By March 1936, she found herself singing at the Queen's Terrace Cabaret in Lancaster, Ohio, with Out in the Cold Again, being one of the songs in her repertoire, no doubt a kind of musical self-assessment. I don't like nightclubs, but I have to live, she said. I'm not a singer, but I have to make a living. Yet she maintained an unwavering hope for a return to Broadway spotlights and Hollywood's film sets. It was during a stint in a New York nightclub that she was reunited with William Janney, her co-star from Young Desire. Janney stumbled upon her performance. I was walking down Broadway when I found the saloon where Mary was working. He explained. From the stage, she announced, Ladies and gentlemen, this is my leading man. I felt really bad because she was drinking. I asked her how she was. She said, Oh, everything's fine with me. Although he sensed the exact opposite was true. In May 1937, Mary found herself confronting the consequences of her past once more, as she was jailed over an unpaid $400 obligation from five years earlier. Her release came after a debt collector's agent consented to provide her additional time. Following her release from jail, she was admitted to the psychiatric division at Bellevue Hospital, appearing exhausted and pale. Shortly after her discharge, Mary opened up about the ordeal and her desperate need for employment. The shock of my recent arrest and brief imprisonment for an old debt put me under a severe nervous strain, she said. I am gaining strength daily, and I am sure that in the near future, I shall be a strong, healthy woman. Recovery proved to be a lengthy process. That same year saw her receiving both medical and psychiatric care at the Brunswick home in Amityville, New York. By October, an emergency led her to being taken to Bellevue Hospital due to an excessive intake of a sedative. After a year spent recuperating in a New York sanatorium, a still delicate Mary ventured back to Hollywood, taking refuge with her sister, Mabel. She was hopeful about revisiting the studios for potential roles, yet the industry had moved on and her once celebrated beauty had faded, leaving no openings for her in film. She adopted the name Mary Wilson and managed a bungalow court, hoping a more secluded life might bring her some happiness. Her saga caught the public's attention once more in 1941 and she sold the story of her experiences to the American Weekly. Following the publication, which serialized the tumultuous chapters of her life throughout the autumn, there was a talk of writing her memoirs and possibly adapting her journey into a film. 
but it wasn't to be. In early 1948, Mary was admitted to Cedars of Lebanon Hospital due to severe malnutrition, with her weight plummeting to a mere 80 pounds. She also received treatment for a gallbladder condition. She later settled into a small room with a bungalow court located at 1504 South Mansfield Avenue. In this place, her prized possession was a grand antique piano, once owned by Rudolph Valentino, which nearly occupied the entire space. I think she worshipped Rudy's memory, her sister Mabel said. She clung personally to this piano and always kept Rudy's picture on the music rack. I think it reminded her of her own greatness and helped her profoundly in her discouragement. By autumn 1948, sensing her time was dwindling, Mary reached out to author Jack Preston to assist in drafting her memoirs. I'm going to die, she confided to him. Their collaboration stretched over two months. On the night of October 30th, Edward Gallagher, a fellow resident, discovered Mary in distress and immediately alerted her sister, who then called her doctor. Despite medical attention around 1 a.m., Gallagher found Mary unresponsive a few hours later and transferred her to another bed. By 8 p.m., suspecting the worst, he rang Dr. Gelfrand again, who upon arrival confirmed Mary had passed away in the early hours of October 31st, 1948, at just 46 years old. The cause of her demise was initially ambiguous. An empty medication container with a note suggesting her own involvement was found. An autopsy later attributed her death to an overdose of secondol, a barbiturate with her death certificate listing it as either accidental or intentional. The note tied to the pill bottle bore the verses of a child's prayer by William Hawley Smith. The poem, about divine protection and nighttime safety, reads, When it gets dark, the birds and flowers shut up their eyes and say good night, and God who loves them counts the hours and keeps them safe till it gets light. Dear Father, count the hours tonight when I am asleep and cannot see, and in the morning may the light shine for the birds, the flowers, and me. Scribbled on the reverse, in Mary's script was the remark, if this were only true. That's all from this episode of Hollywood Mysteries. It's a place where both dreams and nightmares can come true. Sadly, Mary Nolan lived through the latter. See you next time for another episode. Yeah.